After you see a David Lynch film, instead of asking, what did I just watch? What is going on here? A better question might be, how did I just watch? How did the camera show me what it had to show? Look, where's this going? What do you want me to do? You just experienced a series of sounds and images, and that experience can't be captured in a plot summary. I agree. Asking, how do the sounds and images work, is actually the best way to start answering the question, what does the film mean? Okay, I'm thinking. And answering that preliminary question begins with simply noticing what you're seeing and picking out patterns, repetitions, and variations, which are the basis for all art. Sure. Remember this shot? Or this one? Or this one? No way! There's no way! Two eyes and a nose. There are a bunch of extreme close-ups like this in Mulholland Drive. And in this video, I'll show how, if we just notice formal elements like this and think about how they work, they'll take us straight to the heart of this dizzyingly complex movie. We get our first batch in this early scene introducing Adam Kesher. What's the photo for? Well, I think you're going to enjoy your espresso this time. I've done quite a bit of research. What's the photo for? It's a recommendation. It's not a recommendation. This is the girl. That girl is not in my film! Here, the extreme close-ups begin by serving a pretty obvious function, underscoring the determination and mutual hostility of Adam and the Castigliani brother, driving home the tension between the two men, neither of whom will back down. But we've all seen a good stare-down before. What I'm guessing none of us have ever seen before is the incredible bit with the espresso that follows. I'm sorry. That was a highly recommended... That is considered one of the finest espressos in the world. When the espresso arrives mid-confrontation, a secondary but more powerful tension takes over. The tension of waiting to see what will happen when the other Castigliani brother drinks it, and the close-up captures this shift. Adam's attention goes from his conventional adversary across the table to what's more interesting, that which is surprising and new and does not sit within a set of conventions. Now, let's move on to the second set of these shots, which crops up in the scene where Betty persuades Rita, who has amnesia, to open her purse. Your name must be in your purse. You want to know, don't you? Yes, but open it. Watch how their gazes are synchronized, from personal connection, even romantic connection, and the seeking and obtaining of reassurance, down to the object of interest, back to the personal connection, and back to object. There is a sense of clairvoyance about their gazes here, as, without speaking any words from the moment Rita unzips the bag, they both seem to understand one another's thoughts and reactions, and to understand that they are bound to one another by this object, this secret. But again here, the object is familiar enough. We've all seen bags and briefcases full of cash before, if we've seen many crime thrillers or mysteries. I don't know if you've ever seen $100,000, except maybe in the movies. But I assure you, something gets lost in the translation. But after they register the money, Betty and Rita's synchronized gazes take a turn. That blue key, unlike the money, is not something we or they or anyone has ever seen before. You might not even realize at first glance that it's a key. It appears almost not of this world. And we can read this difference in their gazes, which now fall into misalignment and no longer sync up. As in the espresso scene, the introduction of novelty, true novelty, disrupts familiar patterns of looking, forcing a shift from mere recognition to active perception. Taken together, the espresso scene and the purse opening scene both prepare us for a very crucial scene where we get our next set of extreme close-ups. Betty has just demonstrated her extraordinary acting ability in an audition for an unpromising film directed by Bob Booker, and we cut to Adam Kesher's film set across the street, to which Betty will be taken as a result. But the fact that this is where we have been taken is only gradually revealed to us, with the gradual backtracking movement of the camera. First, the seemingly live singing we witness is shown to be taking place behind the glass of a recording studio. And second, as the film cameras come into frame, 
the recording studio itself, along with the outfit's personalities and singing contained within it, is revealed to be a fake. The people are actors, the outfits are costumes, the singing is lip-syncing to a pre-recorded track. It invites us to ask, what kind of audition is this where they just pretend? But of course, that's just what acting is. And it's only in contrast with the emotionally hefty, inescapably real performance we just witnessed from Betty that the artificiality of what's going on here seems so jarring. The sense of this contrast drives the thrill that I, for one, feel with Adam as he spontaneously turns away from these artificial proceedings, as if clairvoyantly alerted to the approach of something new and original, despite his sealed off, technologically mediated focus, watching lip-syncing actors through a camera through a pane of glass while wearing noise-canceling headphones. Sensing something outside of this suffocatingly narrow routine, in which he himself is merely playing the part of the director, since the choice of lead actress, the whole point of this audition, has been taken from him. He senses Betty's presence and turns away from the conventional, the staged, the familiar, the creatively dead, and the cameras push in on both Adam and Betty for the rush of connection, excitement, and emotion. It's important to note, though, that this generic setup a love song plays as two people make eye contact across a room, the cameras push in, and we get meaning-laden close-ups, has in fact been repurposed into something that is itself unusual and striking, because the connection between these two people is not romantic, but creative, and the thrill they are feeling lies in their immediate understanding that they could make great art together, his directing and her acting, rather than a romantic relationship. Again, we get these close-ups, which give us Adams craning away from what one is doing, from the ordinary focus, to something new and unusual, as we saw in the espresso scene, and also give us the sense of clairvoyant connection they did in the purse opening scene. And if all this sounds kind of far-fetched, it's worth noting that Lynch himself has this ability and cast both Naomi Watts and Laura Herring in this very movie on the basis of their headshots, never having seen them act. The power of Adam and Betty's connection is strengthened by the threat posed by the outside interest represented by Ray, who appears as a kind of negative image of the close-ups we've been getting, with his eyes and nose shaded out, manifesting as the blind force of executive control, shutting down the world of possibilities, ensuring the death of creativity. After this interruption, the camera pushes in on Betty a second time when she checks her watch, and there we get the rush of romantic attachment that was withheld from the same camera movement earlier, as she now remembers Rita. And the romantic connection with Rita pulls her away from the creative connection with Adam. That romantic connection, in turn, gives us our next interesting close-up. Once Betty and Rita sleep together, we get this shot. It's quite a bit different in composition and framing from the earlier close-ups of two eyes and a nose, but should be considered in the same set of shots, as will become clear as I continue to trace the series. Here we have two eyes, now distributed across two people, and a nose. It kind of makes a single face, and it kind of doesn't. Betty and Rita, now lovers, both are and aren't each other. This identity and disidentity continues to structure the scene as it unfolds. First, Rita is awoken by the strangeness of her own voice, the sound of her own unfamiliar words uttered in sleep. No, I, but... We cut to a close-up of Rita's face in isolation. Visual separation from Betty occurs, and Rita is reconstituted as an individual face and consciousness. Next, back in the composite shot, Betty's one visible eye opens on her lover, who visually completes her and fills the space against which she appears. As Betty shakes off sleep and becomes more conscious of and alarmed by Rita's voice, she raises herself, and separation occurs again, as it is her turn now to be reconstituted as a complete face, a distinct individual. And at this point, the separation of the two is completed and stabilized, as the presentation shifts to a traditional shot-reverse shot, cutting back and forth between the faces of the two characters in dialogue. Part of what this prepares us for is the melding and redistribution of identities after Rita opens the blue box. The relationship between the pre- and post-blue box sections is the most vexed topic of debate and analysis in discussions of Mulholland Drive. And narrative explanations, like seeing the first part as Diane Selwyn's wish-fulfillment dream, can only get you so far. 
But one of the big points of this video is to show why even if you can't explain how a film holds together narratively, you should try explaining it formally. Stories don't need to make sense in the familiar ways, so long as they're integrated by other means. We don't have to talk about the blue box at all to see how the climax at the end of the movie is made possible and coherent by the formal elements I've been discussing. All of the scenes I've analyzed so far, taken together, carefully set up and give meaning and power to the final and most intense of all these extreme close-ups in the film, just before Diane is driven to shoot herself. The blue key on her table signifies that the hitman she hired has murdered her ex-lover Camilla. When it's finished, you'll find this where I told you. In a standard close-up, she's looking at the key, looking at the key, and then comes the knock on the door. And the knock triggers this brilliant axial cut, bringing us startlingly closer in toward Diane's face as she turns, adding to the jolt of the knock, and, more importantly, preparing the framing for the fragmentation of her face when she turns back and shifts so that only its right half is visible. Here, as with the earlier extreme close-ups, the eye is drawn inexorably to something unusual, novel, and disruptive, breaking ordinary modes of perception. A blue key, like in the purse scene with Betty and Rita, but whereas that blue key was mysterious and puzzling, this key's attraction lies in its disturbing clarity. We and Diane both know exactly what it is and what it means, and that very obviousness is the source of disturbance. And as in the bed scene, we have Naomi Watts' isolated right eye, but this time, the single eye now looks not on her lover, but on the absence of her lover, on the thing that signifies her ultimate irrecoverability. The first isolated right eye, Betty's, was looking at the thing she wanted most to hold in her vision, the face of her beloved. The second, Diane's, is looking at the thing she can least bear to hold in her vision, the lack of her beloved, the death of her beloved, realized in the concrete sign of the blue key left by the hitman. And where in the first scene, we got part of Watts' face and the rest of the frame was filled by Rita's form, here the rest of the frame is a bleak, dark void. And finally, what has happened to the element of clairvoyance from the earlier shots? This particular kind of shot that used to be about connection, whether between Betty and Rita or Betty and Adam, is now about permanently broken connection. And the clairvoyance that once bound people to one another now serves only to torment the lonely mind it's in. The shot becomes visually and sonically suffused with this clairvoyance as Diane's mind shapes what we see and hear. First, these unnatural blue lights turn up as if the peculiar radiance of the key is filling the room and she can't bear to look at it and she winces away. But even while wincing away, she can't stop looking at it. Then, the soundtrack begins to fill with this chilling screaming, which seems to be three things at once. In the past, the screams of Camilla as she's murdered. In the present, Diane's internal voice screaming in her mind. And in the future, Diane's literal screaming, which hasn't yet begun, but soon will, as she flees to the bedroom to put an end to the tragedy of her existence and round out the tragic arc of Mulholland Drive. Thank you.